Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Day two of the Zero Project Conference 2023. And we are here with a fireside chat titled, Whose Job Is This? Defining Accessibility Roles in Newsrooms. And I'm very excited to have a distinguished speaker with us, remotely joining us from Washington, D.C. His name is Holton Foreman, and he has a very interesting job title. Specifically, he's the first ever accessibility engineer at the Washington Post. He's fresh in his role, and I figure, without further ado, let's go live with Holden, and he can tell us a bit more about his role, how he defines accessibility at the Washington Post, and perhaps some neat initiatives he's working on in order to ensure that the Washington Post, which we all have read, certainly at one point in our time, is more accessible for all, persons with and without disabilities. Holden Foreman, the virtual floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Holden, uh, he, him pronouns. I, uh, yeah, I actually moved to New York recently, uh, fun fact, but I uh, used to live in DC and I'm really excited to have this new job at the Post. Um, the first thing I'll say, and I want to stress, you know, during a talk like this is that accessibility was not new to me or like to the Post as a company when we created this job. Uh, the job was not created as, you know, okay, this is a new thing we're going to start working on. I've been doing various projects, uh, sort of side work and, you know, incorporating accessibility practices into my day-to-day -day job uh, over my time at the Post. Um, and it was really exciting to sort of see that evolve into the uh, need for a full-time role and us sort of understanding how a full-time role could be beneficial. Um, so I think the first thing I'll say uh, is, you know, um, we see nowadays in media much more awareness uh, about accessibility. Uh, that comes, I think, from a few things. Uh, one uh, really big thing I think over the past couple of years has been social media. Uh, really, a lot of journalists, reporters, uh, people in media are on uh, social media sites very often. And uh, I've been exposed to things like alt text, uh, the need for captions on videos they post and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it was really exciting to see like those piecemeal considerations evolve into how we could form a full-time role. You touched upon alt text and captions and let's, let's call them basics uh, for the argument here. Can you tell us a bit more beyond alt text, beyond captions? What are some of the accessibility considerations at the Washington Post? And how are those informed and driven by the accessibility working group, which, if I'm not mistaken, you helped form at the Washington Post? Yeah, uh, certainly. This is why I think the job is so exciting, is that there are so many things that, uh, you know, when you dig past the surface, really matter a lot uh, to our audience. So the first thing we think of often as a you know, newspaper <laughs> is our actual writing and how we're conveying information to people, right? I think there's a, there's definitely a perception <laughs> that uh, media isn't accessible in terms of just how it is written, you know, the, the actual language used, uh, the wording of things. It generally is catering to a, a, a very well-educated older audience. Uh, and, you know, when you think of things like the curb cut effect and how uh, work, working on accessibility benefits everyone, that's a really common thing that comes up in my conversations is, you know, you have people with cognitive disabilities, you have people who uh, need a different format in terms of information they consume, but that benefits everybody because that benefits people who are not coming from journalism backgrounds, these like uh, backgrounds where they're used to reading content in really complicated formats or just complicated language. Uh, that's something that I think is really important and I'm passionate about because it's just ubiquitous everywhere. Um, another thing that kind of thing comes up a lot when you dig past those, you know, like you said, captions and alt text is, um, thinking about the sort of different settings and tools that people use to actually navigate content. Of course, with all text, we think about like screen, readers, screen readers, right? Um, and I think it's great people are, you know, talking about that more and more with each day. And I think uh, becoming well acquainted with how a screen reader works, but uh, we wanna be careful not to uh, equate accessibility with screen reader support. Uh, so one thing we think about is can people use the website? Uh, can they, people who see the website, sighted users, use it with the keyboard controls instead of just a mouse, right? Uh, we have like a lot of hover content is popular in journalism and like looking at maps and stuff like that. Um, so something else that I've definitely worked on a lot is going through and understanding the different controls people can use on our site and also the different browser settings they may have. So that may be like they have enlarged font size on their browser or they have uh, color, you know, they have a dark mode or they have high color contrast modes on their browser. Um, that is uh, something else that I think we're really big on. It's just trying to reduce those assumptions we have and go through using the tools that our users use um, and ensure the content works every way. Sounds great. 
Your job title, accessibility engineer. Everyone understands something different on the engineer. Could you maybe elaborate a bit more how the post defines that job role, how you see it? And also perhaps within that answer, are there any capacity building measures which are undertaken to not only make ensure that, you know, Holden at the post knows what accessibility is, but that it maybe other editors, maybe other folks at the Washington Post understand and can share uh, the knowledge that you have obtained already through various measures. Yeah, you mentioned the accessibility working group. Uh, I did start that. That was an informal, uh, it's a pretty informal body, um, but that started in 2021 as a result of me sort of having done a bit of work over time, deciding that it'd be great to skill share and sort of like talk to my colleagues about things that are coming up, things that are interesting, you know, interesting solutions we found, uh, feedback we've gotten. So, um, and just updates in the accessibility world more general because it is a really exciting space. Uh, that group uh, was sort of the start of another part of my job, which is the actual education aspect. So like you said, you know, it can't just be me, can't just be Holden running around, <laughs> uh, sort of putting out fires, so to speak, uh, everywhere across the company. That doesn't really benefit anybody. And, you know, employees are not permanent. So we need to build a foundation for, this is a very large, you know, very old company. Uh, we need to build a foundation for the future. So a lot of that is um, going around and just getting uh, a lay of the land in terms of talking to different teams. You know, this is not, I want to make sure I'm clear that like other teams have people that are doing accessibility stuff. We have accessibility specialists around the post. Uh, we recently hired our first disability reporter, Amanda Morris is her name. Uh, she's very passionate about some of these digital web accessibility concepts as well. Uh, we have people in news design who care about it a lot. We have people uh, in product. So my job is partially just centralizing all these different discussions and sort of silos that are already around the company regarding accessibility and hosting more like broad, you know, trainings, uh, sort of uh, uh, institutional knowledge. So documentation of, you know, the different practices we've adopted over time, uh, things we're working on. Um, and that's that means that my role is kind of uh, less coding than you might think when you hear the word like, you know, software engineer. Uh, a lot of it is is talking to people. And I think that's really that's really fun. and really rewarding to see how people do care about this. People are already trying to do the work and we can help bring that together into one cohesive um, you know, body. Sounds great. Um, Holden, you mentioned Amanda Morris, who was hired by the Washington Post and before that was a dis disability reporting fellow at the New York Times. Now the New York Times and the Washington Post, big names in media, big names known beyond the United States of America. That they get accessibility right or are on the right path is good, but I'm wondering in your estimation and the experience you've had at the Post, is what you're doing translatable to other newsrooms, smaller and perhaps bigger than yours? Is it something which is also translatable to say community media? Are the lessons learned and the mechanisms you've put into place, and also you mentioned the interpersonal communication, is that, um, uh, so to say, a, a blueprint which can be replicated in other newsrooms? And if yes, how? Uh, the answer is I really hope so. Uh, I'm, I'm very early in the job, as, as you mentioned. So uh, I definitely uh, don't think we're there yet in terms of, you know, uh, I'm ready to go to other newsrooms and sort of give them a formula or sort of like help Skillshare with them. But what I will say is that even before taking this job, the accessibility community and media is very cooperative, very collaborative. Um, I've had discussions with people across different newsrooms already. You mentioned the New York Times. They hired a accessibility editor uh, in visuals department, uh, Jamie Tanner. Um, so I've chatted with folks like that from other groups. And I think that one cool thing about working at these big companies like the Times and the Post um, is the opportunity to you know, use our resources, like you said, to sort of help smaller newsrooms. And one thing that I really think is cool about that is potential for like open source. So you know, in software, open source is a very big thing. And I think uh, there are some media projects out there that, that do it really well. Uh, not any that I'm aware of accessibility specifically, but I think that if that's an opportunity that comes up in my job to sort of develop some open source tools or think about some of the ways we're uh, handling things here and allow other newsrooms to to sort of use tools like that, that would be awesome. Uh, I can't, you know, can't make any promises. It's still early in the job, but that's something that really, I think, leaps out in my mind in terms of that, uh, that skill sharing and sort of, you know, using our resources, being cognizant of our uh, privilege as such a large, you know, newsroom, well-funded newsroom. Uh, but the interpersonal stuff, totally. Like, I'm already happy to do that with people. I, I do have conversations already, you know, with folks here and there. I go to some of these kind of group community calls that are hosted by different orgs. Um, and that's been a good play to, place to kind of organically talk to folks, uh, share some of the things I'm looking at. And if people, you know, want to tweet at me or sort of uh, give me a call whenever, like, or email me, I'm always happy to uh, 
help where I can uh, on a personal level. All right, online audience, you heard the call to action. Tweet at Holden <laughs> Foreman. Uh, he is interested and willing to share his institutional wisdom. So thank you for that. Perhaps with, with, within that uh, call to action you just made, are there any resources you would like to point people to, either who are working in the media space or looking to get into the media space to better understand accessibility or certain tools which have also personally helped you on your accessibility journey? Yeah. Um, uh, so I'll start with the basic, you know, the basic things. Uh, you know, we work on digital web accessibility. Uh, so WCAG, WCAG, <laughs> those guidelines are, of course, very huge. Um, I, I imagine most people at a conference like this are probably somewhat familiar with it, but if not, that is essentially uh, the, I'd say, single most like well-known or like respected sort of guidance for web accessibility and technical level. And it, it can be kind of technical. So I think that's one thing with journalists that's, that's hard is, you know, a lot of people don't have the money to uh, hire engineers, right? Or people that have engineering titles and sort of have uh, engineering backgrounds. So um, I do start with that resource, but I like to also mention there are other groups like the National Center of Disability and Journalism in the United States. Uh, so that's uh, Arizona State University. Uh, there are Kristen great Gilger is with us here in Vienna, so she'll appreciate appreciate the shout out. Yeah, and actually now now that I mention it, I think she uh, helped connect us. So <laughs> it's funny I actually forgot about that. But um, yeah, so that's a great that's a great resource uh, for sure. Um, I think something else that I would never discredit um, is you know, just kind of going on social media or like going on Google and like searching like things as they come up, because I think people sometimes are scared to take that jump or like they want to have like uh, a sort of single uh, guide uh, shown. But what I found is that through searching around, there's tons of universities, you know, you, you, universities big and small. So like you see like guides from Harvard on different accessibility practices. You see guides from these like small state schools in the United States that, you know, you may not even know of, but they have great guides. Like I was looking at uh, this is actually a bigger state school. But I was looking at the University of Washington. The computer science program there is very, very big. And they had a great accessibility uh, guide that is just publicly posted and goes through things in a, in a very readable format, I think. Um, so that might, be a less, that might be a good lesser known one for people to check out. Um, the UW, I think, IT uh, accessibility guides are, are very nice. Um, but yeah, I think like, um, you know, there are lots of uh, individual speakers and voices. If you go on like Twitter, for instance, and kind of look up disability lists or, you know, use some of the hashtags accessibility or ally. Uh, I found a lot of stuff just from surf, like, you know, surfing the web like that. Holden, this is the second time you mentioned Twitter. So I think this would be the right opportunity to, for you to, to uh, disclose your Twitter handle where people can find you. Where do you want to be found? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will caveat this with, you know, we, we know Twitter is in a, a, a bit of a, a state in terms of uh, accessibility it has actually <laughs> been decreasing on Twitter from, <laughs> from what I've seen recently. So I don't want to, uh, I don't want to force people onto it. I do have a Mastodon as well. The handle is HS Foreman. Uh, so, you know, uh, my two initials and last name. And uh, I also, yeah, I, like I said, um, I'm available over email. If you can find, I think on those accounts are accessibility at washpost.com email. I think it's in my bio and uh, if you're not a social media person or if that's, you know, not your cup of tea, then then please, uh, you can use those other formats. But I am always happy. Uh, I, did, I do still use Twitter uh, for now, and I'm always happy to talk on it. Very good. So be it Twitter, be it Mastodon, or be it email, Holden's happy to hear from you. So please do reach out to him. Holden, thank you for your time. I'll just summarize. Also, the NCDJ, that's the abbreviation of the National Center on Disability Journalism, their style guide. So please Google NCDJ style guide. It's available in English. It's available in Spanish. If I'm not mistaken, it's also been translated into Farsi and Italian, and I think also Romanian. So global uh, representation for using the right language and style when talking about uh, disability. Holden Foreman, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for uh, helping us define accessibility um, in the Washington Post newsroom, for pointing out a lot of useful resources for established and aspiring accessibility uh, individuals working in newsrooms around the world. Thank you to the online audience for tuning in. Uh, we're day two of the Zero Project Conference 2023. I encourage you to take Holden up on his word, reach out to him, and also to reach out to us at the Zero Project, zeroproject.org. Thank you very much, Holden. And um, before I, I, I close it out, c can I assume that you're a Taylor Swift fan? Because I see, I see a couple of <laughs> album covers at the back. Is that the case? Yeah, I'm a big, uh, big music fan, uh, but I do listen to my share of Taylor Swift. <laughs> oh, all right, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Holden, thank you very much. Have a great day. Um, stay safe in New York. All the best, and thank you for your time again.
Appreciate it.